Right now, it would seem to most people like the situation that's unfolding in Ukraine, especially as it concerns Russia, presents the single biggest risk. But maybe it isn't. I want you to share with us your view of what's happening there, how you think it's going to unfold, and whether we're missing something bigger. Uh, certainly among the global tail risks, the one coming from uh, Ukraine is the most important one. There is the beginning now of a new Cold War between the West and Russia. And this Cold War could actually become a hot war if, as possible, Russia were to effectively destabilize and invade uh, the eastern provinces of Ukraine, in which case things could escalate. You could have another episode of global risk aversion. If this will become a real war, then you could have even a situation in which the supply of gas to Europe may be cut off from Russia. The European economy is barely now recovering from a recession that could tip back the Eurozone into a recession. From a risk management standpoint, put on, from a 1 to 10 scale, how concerned are you that things could get catastrophic there? Well, uh, today I would say the risk is around 7 and rising because uh, the situation wow. is at this point one in which Russia seems to be really very aggressive in Ukraine. They want to try to take over Ukraine and therefore an escalation is likely to occur. Okay, but in escalation in what form? You talked about the possibility that this might become a hot war, which, yeah. which I take to mean the use of force on both sides. Yeah, yeah. Suppose that the, but, suppose but that, that, that Russia... assumes that NATO will act. Well, let's put it this way. Suppose Ukraine. that Russia at this point decides to effectively either to destabilize, to invade uh, the eastern province of Ukraine. Two things will happen. The sanctions of the West will have to become more severe and Russia could have counter sanction going as far as limiting the supply of gas, not just to Ukraine, right. but also to Western Europe. Secondly, the NATO, even if they're not going to have a military intervention, they'll have certainly to provide some military support to the government in Kiev. And that means that this war could escalate for quite a while. And therefore, from a financial market point of view, there may be contagion deriving to advanced economies, financial market, especially in the Eurozone. But could it really escalate for quite a while? Because we know that if Putin wants to exercise force yes. in a big way, he yeah. can, and there's really nobody capable of responding to it other than the United States. Well, uh, the situation is such that even if he wanted to use force, there could be a guerrilla war, first of all. Secondly, he's not going to invade all of uh, Ukraine. And you don't know for how long a military conflict of this sort is going to continue, especially if the U.S. and Europe were then to support militarily the government in mm. Kiev. This war could continue and last for a while. So I'm saying this is not my baseline, but there is certainly okay. downside risk that that will happen. But even a baseline in which this conflict remains lingering for a while, at some point investors may be becoming worried about it. What does all this mean for the European economy? Well, the Eurozone right now is recovering. Uh, there's been a severe recession. There's a beginning of an economic recovery. But this recovery is fragile, is anemic, is uneven, especially in the peripheral of the Eurozone. I would say the last thing that the Eurozone can afford and need right now is another shock coming from an increase in gas prices and or an even a cutoff of supply of gas coming from Russia to the Western European economies. That would tip the European economies back into a recession if that were to occur. Given the scenario that you just painted, Nouriel, does it make any sense to you that Spain is selling bonds at record low yields? Well, given uh, the whatever it takes speech by Draghi, given the OMT, given the ESM, given the additional easing of monetary policy will occur by the ECB, given the beginning of an economic recovery, the beginning of a banking union, it's not surprising that the tail risk of the Eurozone have receded. The tail risk of a breakup of Italy and Spain losing market access, now given the spreads, investors are coming back in the Eurozone. What can derail the Eurozone recovery could be a shock coming from Ukraine. You recently came out with the six largest risks facing a global economy. Yeah. What are you most concerned about? Well, I would say, leaving aside the issue of Ukraine, I would say the other big tail risk is the one coming from China. I spent many days in Beijing just last week. And I would say that while the consensus believes that China is going to have a soft landing growth above 7% for the next few years, my reading of the data is that because of the buildup of leverage, because of the need to rebalance the economy from fixed investment to consumption, they'll have to slow down this excessive credit growth. And that implies that this year growth is going to be barely 7%, next year 65 the following year probably 6% or lower. Now, it's not a true hard landing if you think about a financial meltdown with growth at 3 4%, but there's a bumpier, a much rougher landing than the 7 5% that the consensus expects about China. That means that if there is one thing that is not priced in financial market, is a slowdown of China as sharp as I do expect in the next couple of years. Nouriel, why aren't more people talking about the unexploded bombs in China's shadow banking system? 
Mm. Well, people are starting to talk about it. Uh, you have a huge amount of bad assets in the shadow banking system. There are also plenty of bad assets in the formal banking system. And now the Chinese authorities are telling us they want to crack down on the moral hazard coming from the shadow banking system. They want to let some institution to fail. But without deposit insurance and without any other types of guarantees, if they're serious about moral hazard, you could have a whole run against the shadow banking system. And that could be the beginning of unraveling of the Chinese financial system. I don't think that they, are, um, they are underestimate the risks that are coming from Iran on the financial system if you are really serious about cracking down on moral hazard and imposing market discipline by having defaults and restructuring. What situation that we've seen before is most comparable to what China may face? Well, in East Asia, for example, in the 1990s, there was a boom in fixed investment from 30 to 37 percent of GDP was excessive, and then it led to the East Asian financial crisis. In China, fixed investment was already in 2008 something like 42 percent of GDP, much higher than East Asia, and it went all the way to 50 percent of GDP. No country in the world can be so productive. You take every year half of your GDP, you're investing into real estate, infrastructure, excess capacity, industrial system. You're not going to have down the line first of all a hard landing of that fixed investment a large surge of MPLs in the financial system and three a major surge of private and public debts that's the risk that China is facing today you're also concerned that the Fed may raise rates too quickly and cut off recovery do you think Janet Yellen's not doing a good job yet she's doing a very good job what I'm pointing out is that while she's on the dovish side of the FOMC there are now 12 members of the FOMC the FOMC today is a collegial democracy it's not the monarchy it used to be under Alan Greenspan it changed under Bernanke she's also collegial and right the entire FOMC has changed out of the seven members of the board four are gone Sarah Raskin Elizabeth Duke Jeremy Stein and Ben Bernanke there are two new members are going to be confirmed Leo Brennan and Stan Fisher two new have to come in most likely the new members are not as dovish as Janet Yellen and of the new voting members of the FMC among the regional presidents of the Fed there are three new hawks there's Plosser there is Fisher and there is the new head of the Cleveland Fed who used to be the advisor of Plosser at the Philly Fed so there is a shift towards I would say a less dovish composition of the FMC that may imply that the Fed might hike sooner and faster even if Janet Yellen personally is probably more dovish than the average FMC member. But what about the other challenge that confronts the Fed? Reversing unconventional monetary policy, shrinking the balance sheet. How do you expect the Fed, again, given the dynamics of the FOMC that you just described, to handle that situation? Well, it's a bit of a delicate knife edge situation for the Fed. Either they exit sooner and too fast and there is a bond market drought and they have a hard landing of the economy or if they wait too long and there is a risk they're going to wait too long and exit too, too late because the economy is still weak unemployment is high and inflation is low think about it they're not going to be done with tapering until the end of this year they're right. going to stay on hold until the middle of next year and it's going to take them three to four years to normalize from zero to four there is already frothiness in financial market in parts of the credit market in parts of the equity market a year from now or two years from now we've still policy rates very low the risk is actually that this frothiness leads to an asset bubble and an asset boom and bubble eventually like 2007 8 can lead to a bust and a crash it's not a risk for this year but i would say the risk is that the fed exit too little too late and we're going to recreate the same kind of frothiness a bubble we saw a few years ago followed by a bust and a crash all right well dr doom i do want to end on a high note you have spent the last several months in asia africa europe South South America and here in the US where is there a bright spot where have you been pleasantly surprised saying ah, I like what I'm seeing anywhere well I would say overall the global economy is recovering the average advanced economy gonna grow 2% this year rather than one better than that in the US in Canada and UK less than that in Japan and the eurozone it has been a bumpy period of time for many emerging markets but on average they're gonna still grow 5% so there is a recovery of the global economy but I would say there are a whole bunch of risks China is one Ukraine and Russia is another one uncertain about what the Fed is gonna do is another one whether the eurozone is gonna truly recover is another one so there is a recovery that's the positive but there are a bunch of tail risk and fragility on the other side he won't end on a high note